call the committee of the whole meeting to order for September the 9th. Uh, we have an amendment to the agenda before approval. Please add 4C and we'll add bylaw number 1463 to amend the district of whole 2015-2024 permissive tax exemption bylaw 1356. So we add that to 4C. And now I'm looking for an approval of the amended agenda. On the move. Thank you. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Adoption of the minutes for the Committee of the Whole meeting held August the 26th be adopted as presented. Thank you, Councillor. Moved and second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Other pertinent business? I'll turn it over to staff at this time, please. And I didn't follow my new rule right off the bat. <laughs> Good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, Council. The first order of uh, business is to deal with the fees and charges by law, and um, my colleague, the Director of Finance, Mr. Dale Curtis, is here to explain this in detail if required. The purpose is to bring our fees and charges uh, in line with the new solid waste contract. Um, so I'd like to pass it over to Dale. Thank you. Um, as you're all aware, we, we have a new provider of, of waste management uh, services effective May, and it was necessary to uh, have a look at our current uh, waste management uh, and collection, weight, uh, collection fees and disposal. Um, so what you have before you is, is what staff's put together uh, based on uh, the numbers provided by the by uh, Valley Waste, <coughs> excuse me, and what we did is is the red that you see on this is uh, our recommended changes, uh, and what we built into this is of course we have a, uh, our own administration fees to cover, uh, software costs uh, when we send out the. The utility bills to an outside provider, we have to pay for the postage and the utility bills themselves. Uh, staff time for preparing the site, the billing cycles throughout the year. Staff time for uh, fielding customer concerns and, and complaints and and what have you. So we we've estimated our admin costs. So what we've done here is uh, tried to recoup that because the the idea with, with these fees is we're not supposed to be, we're not a profit center where we're supposed to make a lot of money on our on our fees that we charge. So we're, we're basically attempting with this uh, new schedule to bylaw 1461 is to build in a, a, an amount in the fees to cover that estimated cost. Of course it's just an estimate. Um, these fees may have to be reviewed in a year to see how we did. Uh, based on the, the new contractor's uh, uh, charges throughout the year. Uh, so basically on, on average for the commercial uh, and the recycling, uh, we've built in about a 3% uh, increase over what they're going to charge us. Uh, so that coupled with the increase in the residential rates from uh, 267.75 to 298, uh, the, bulk, the bulk of the coverage of our uh, admin costs is going to be absorbed by that uh, because the commercial ones isn't quite such the, the, the revenue generator. Uh, the uh, residential rate, if I can add about the Recycle BC, uh, we've been able to reduce that increase because of the revenue that we get uh, on the flip side from recycling. So, um, that rate, although it's uh, increased over last, actually the rate hasn't <coughs> changed for over five years. I don't think this schedule's been changed since uh, uh, previous contractors. So uh, you also note that there's increases, but there's also de decreases. So it's not like we're increasing right across the board. There are some areas where their rates that were submitted in the RFP are a lot lower than what we are currently charging, so we can't justify it. Our higher rate um, 
compared to what they're charging us. So again, the, the idea being here is that we, as the district, just do not lose out in our costs, but at the same time providing reasonable rates for, for the consumer. Um, so, uh, the, uh, again, everything in red is, is the uh, proposed changes. There's some uh, verbiage that's changed a bit in some areas. Um, and this is all reflective of, of what was responded to in our RRP um, for the categories that are provided in this new schedule. And uh, the rates are proposed to be effective um, October 1st, 2019. That's our last, the last quarter of the, the, the year we bill. Uh, so we need the rates to be effective October 1st. The residential rate, of course, isn't going to go into effect as you see here until January 1st, 2020, because that's when we do our annual residential billing is in January. So uh, we have to absorb whatever we, we have in the transition for the last five months of the year um, with, the, with the change from, from suppliers. So we may lose a little bit on the residential side this year, but uh, once we get caught up and get going through a regular cycle, we'll, we should be able to review that. And, as I mentioned, I think probably a year from now we, we'd be in a better position to see how our numbers worked out with our recommendations on the uh, on the rates that are proposed before you. Uh, but again, the, the, it's about a three uh, percent increase uh, from whatever was in the previous schedule to cover the costs uh, or help cover the costs of our own admin because uh, we we run about thirty to thirty five thousand dollars in admin charges that we absorb with wages and, and postage and bills and staff time, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you for that update. I think it's uh, prudent to remind the public that uh, with this garbage contract is increased service. We're picking up organics and glass and providing totes. So that should be uh, considered as well as, a, as part of this uh, rate increase. Uh, over the next, well, not till January 1st, as you have said. I'll entertain any questions from uh, Council at this time. Councillor Medlock. Thank you. I have a few comments and questions. Um, first, simple comment, probably just to got missed, but in the uh, first section there, oops. Uh, yeah, the very first thing, you've got all the, the commercial. Uh, monthly, weekly, etc. And then at the end this is commercial bag service and you still have blue bags included in there? So yeah. unlimited <coughs> multi-recycling blue bag or clear bag? I assume that that is no longer should be removed. Uh, that's, that's a good catch, yes, because I don't understand that. I'm not familiar enough with the, what the new contract has, but I understand that the blue bag are... They're not using it. They're not using it. Yeah. So just didn't catch that. Should be. Um, <coughs> well, we can... Um, and clarify that very quickly. Uh, I can't see how any blue bags be allowed or residential aren't allowed. The reason being, of course, that um, we will provide the totes for the residential and it reduces uh, the cost, obviously, and it's according to the Recycle BC contract. Um, what I would recommend uh, Council consider is if we don't get the answer in time, um, is that we we can change that detail later. I don't think that's a, a big technical hang-up. And in fact, it may be the case because new bags for industrial potentially are handled different, but I will find out. Okay. And, and if I could just add on that, um, this uh, schedule is going to have to be revisited probably later in the year once more information is known on the... Uh, uh, there's not, uh, unfortunately, Kevin's not here, but there's one area where we, we needed to review once the containers are, are known for the organics and everything else. So it will be coming back to you, so that's when we could clear up that, uh, that verbiage in that section that's no longer really applicable. It doesn't affect the rates of the call. No, at all. That, that one but it's, it's a good observation. That's correct. It should be clear now. Yeah. And then the other question I have is about the roll off. So that's all in red, so I'm assuming that it's all new. I don't remember any charges in the past for roll-offs so that have broken it out to 12 yard, 20 yard, 30 yard, 40 yard. Um, I wasn't really a fan of having the commercial collection included in 
the RFP from the start and just that I thought you should leave it up to free enterprise. Now, I don't know why the district would want to take on the administration of a new service, if you will. There's lots of other options out there. First Class also offers roll-off bins. Valley has done that as well and they have the option to strike a deal with whoever they want at whatever their rates, as there's a local as well. Um, I'm just curious as to why that's in there. I don't feel like it should be. Um, purely on our side of things, from the administrative costs, and the district has to deal with that, this should be completely out of the picture. I don't think we have to deal with the roll off bins at all. Just curious as to why that's in there. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's in there because it was, uh, it was uh, included in the RFP, and this does lay out, I guess, an option for commercial customers. So if they do want to utilize the service, they're able to utilize uh, Valley through us. That doesn't necessarily say that they can't, for, for roll loss, for temporary pickup, what have you, they couldn't use competitors. Provided their regular commercial waste collection and recycling is right. done according to the bylaw, which is through us. Right, so if a, if a resident, whoever phoned the district and said, I'd like a roll-off bin, we automatically go with Valley? We, or do we yes. recommend other options? Because there are other options. If we're going to simply recommend Valley, I, I'm uncomfortable with that because then we're supporting Valley only for that service, and I don't think that we should be involved in that. As far as recommending goes, uh, this is this is new, Councilor Medlock. Uh, so this fee schedule is there for the public to see. Um, I believe, and in talks with uh, with Valley, we can make it clear that your schedule is here for all to see. However, we can say that this is one option to customers when they call. There are other options. Have a look and compare prices. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm really not comfortable with that section. Um, the other two or three things, um, mattresses have doubled from $10 to $20. Is that because our cost to dispose of them is also increased? Mr. Mayor, that's part of it, and as I recall, um, there were, the last council did authorize going back up to 20. Yeah, I can't remember. I don't, I don't remember what the mattress recycling facility charges. That's 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. 20. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it, it is competitive. It is 20. Yeah. Okay. That, I mean, you know, if it's, this, this, if it's the rate, it's the rate. That I was just curious about the, the reason. Um, and the minimum fee, I remember in the past, having a discussion about that. Um, I don't remember what the rate was before, but I think it was 10 and went down to five, but now it's 10 here again, because it's red being new. Um, the concern I have with minimum fee is, well, I understand why you need it, because some people will go in with a you know, few dollars worth of garbage sometimes, um, and there are costs involved no matter what. Uh, but when you start increasing fees, you start increasing people's uh, unlikeliness to bring it to the landfill and to just dump it out in the woods, which is happening a lot. So, is it $10 currently, you said? I heard somebody say, or they don't know. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, there, there is a, a current minimum fee, and I think it's either 10 or 1080. In fact, I paid it just last week. It was 10 dollars I paid 1080. So if it's the same, then I'm okay with that. I don't want to see it really go up. I think it was 10 last year as well. Okay. Um, biggest increase here, of course, is the $175 a ton rate for municipal solid waste. And they've taken away all the categories and put it all into one. That's a $60 a ton increase. Um, I checked with Bailey Landfill because they're the next closest large landfill, I suppose. And they're only $93 a ton. So that's almost double. It's you know $11 less than double. Um, and that's... a. Uh, Increasing it, I suppose, helps bring in some revenue, and I understand that's needed, but it also increases uh, the chance that somebody's not going to be willing to pay that, and they're going to dump it in the bush, which, again, is a big problem. Uh, it's going all over our area, and I don't want to see it increase because we're raising rates. Um, so I'm, I'm really not comfortable with that at all either. If I could just add on that point. <coughs> By the looks of this, that 175 for municipal solid waste has not changed. It's the description there has changed because it's not in red. So we, we haven't well, changed the rate. The way I read it was there was a category of refuse at 115 a ton, and that is what 
the generic garbage was taken in at. The 175 a ton was simple compostable waste, not de-bagged. That was the highest rate. So now, the way I read this is uh, all solid waste is going to be 175 a ton, and then the yard waste that's not bagged is 75 a ton, which it looks like it was before. I don't know, it's a little confusing. I know that there's some descriptions and some category changes there too, but how I read this is there's no longer a rate for regular garbage at 115 a ton or less. It's simply 175 a ton. I, I think that's where you're going. Yeah. I think that's too great of an increase, and that's going to be a deterrent for people to use the landfill, and it's going to be an attraction for them to use the woods. And Mr. Mayor, just a, a comment on that as well. When we track and we look at uh, the loads going in. First off, municipal solid waste, the residential and commercial customers have municipal um, pickup curbside. Uh, so <clears throat> they should be utilizing that service first. When we looked at who, who dumped uh, refuse versus unsorted loads, there's really no kind of clear difference. And it does simplify this. It does simplify it, and of course the price is, is going up if you consider it from that perspective. The other perspective is, Again, from the revenue side of the house, that the operator generates operating revenue from that which crosses the scale, and we have to we have to monitor that closely with them and, and look at that as we move through the relationship. So um, that was one way of seeming to balance it. And again, that's that's something we can track. And in December, we'll be bringing back a figure as well to uh, reference the landfill. Anyway, anyway, we're res respecting the we we'll continue to listen. So I have okay. Anyone have the same? No, sir. So, so for you, Mr. Mayor, I have a question. Do we have a contract with um, so the waste management people now? Signed contract? Yes, we have. Okay. Mr. Mayor, yes, we Okay. Um, what are the, going to be the cost of the totes, and who's going to be paying for them? Um, the totes are covered by the contractors, so they'll be owned and maintained by Valley Waste. They'll be issued and, uh, to each customer, each resident, and they'll be identified as such, and that's how that'll work. And so each resident will have three totes or two totes? Three. Do you know what the cost of those totes are? I don't, but at the end of the, at the, end of the day, that charge will not be directly coming back to the district. It's obviously indirectly built in. <coughs> But well, we don't have any information yet because they haven't chosen and confirmed the tote. Because when I went and investigated, I was told by a contractor that they're around three hundred dollars each tote. So that's we are offering two different sizes. So depending on what you're, I'm just saying you're now because <coughs> it's an average tote. Yeah. So I'm just wondering where the cost because that's a lot of money to the contract to come up with for every resident, say even two totes. That's $600 per resident. That's, that's a lot. Well, the here again, can absorb. So I'm just wondering if we're going to be absorbing that or the residents are going to be absorbing that or who's going to absorb it. As per the RFP response in the contract, the contractor covers that and they set, for, and this is really for the residential mm -hmm. portion of the contract, mm -hmm. they've set uh, the rate which we've incorporated here with a bit of an administrative markup. Mm -hmm. So that's all in, totes and all, at that rate. which is three totes, and I believe they're 65 gallon totes. We thought about two sizes, but administratively it's too different. So, with the built-in chip to identify the address and who, who's uh, tote, is that correct? That, that is correct. So you'll be able to confirm the location that that tote was issued to mm -hmm. by an identifier. Yeah. Well, I understand that, but I'm just, I'm concerned. I can't see how the contractor could come up with that cost without passing it on to the resident or the district. And that's my real concern. I'm um, just wondering how we will know if it's in the contract, and it's a five-year contract, I put them. So they're going to amortize it over the five years, this cost? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, again, it was included in the RFP, and it is in the contract. It's not a direct cost. The only cost laid out to the residential uh, customer are the, are the rates. It's built into the rates, and that was part of the value proposition that led staff in its analysis to pick this over other respondents. 
Okay, thank you. Councillor Stewart. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to say that I have uh, similar concerns to Councillor Neville. Um, and the, the biggest of that is the $30 a month increase for seniors and people with disabilities. And I feel that that may be cost prohibitive for them. Excuse me, Councillor Stewart. Per year. Per year. $30. Per year? Okay. Per year. So I still think that that is a, a fairly um, good increase for someone who is not going to expect an increase in their um, CPP contributions. Also, the other one is the difference between the 115 and the 175. I've had many people bring that to my attention as a concern. And um, I just wanted to say that I feel the same way that we need to relook at the 175 um, per ton. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, certainly on the, on the first point about the uh, the increase, we recognize for residential customers our recommendation being uh, roughly thirty dollars. But here again, um, for a thirty percent increase in, in basically processing for a new stream of collectible, which is organics, uh, they're seeing a thirty dollar a year increase, as well as they're getting the toter service and more value added. So it is a, it is a balancing uh, exercise, Mr. Mayor. And, and if I could just add too, is the, the current rate is at least five years old. And again, with that, that there was no totes involved and technology changed and, and unfortunately the prices do go up. So, and, and it may be even, I, I have to go research it, but it could be even longer than five years with that rate's been, that's, a, that's good. <coughs> yeah. So I just have one more question for you. Um, I heard that the District of Hope is going to have to come up with $10,000 or thereabouts to service the, the dump over the next year on top of this. Is that anything? Is that just your say? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, no, and I'm not sure you get that. What we do is we work with a contractor every month to review the cost and revenue, and then we work to um, minimize or eliminate any loss. So here's the equation. So if if for whatever reason there's a loss, we look to address that. If there's any profits, well, that's no problem. And if the trend continues that that transfer station operation remains profitable, which is, I'm not sure, it's a very small one. I mean, then we can go in discussions as far as potentially lowering costs to district rate payers. But we have to get there. So there's nothing in the contract that says the possibility within a year if they look over the, the schedule for a year that we might have to come up with ten thousand dollars to help subsidize the transfer station we may have to come up with money to help subsidize again as we go on a month by month basis mm -hmm. we'll look at the the if they made a profit or if they made a loss and then we'll address that and we have to make up losses it may be two thousand it may be five thousand but the director of operations and myself are monitoring that very closely thank you any more questions, Council? So if staff's okay with this, I'd like to uh, put it forward to, uh, to Council, uh, that, and then we would come back, you'd come back in, the, in December, was that the recommendation? We'd come back in December with the, if there's a potential rate change to... Yep. Uh, now, now we'll lose a quarter of commercial there. Yep. Well, that's... that's, that's well, if it's not, yeah, I mean, if the bylaw is not uh, adopted, then we have to, we wouldn't be able to build a commercial rates until January. We'd have to absorb whatever the current rates are. So that's why what, what I'd like to do is, is do it as is, and then uh, we could talk to staff about coming back to us later again for another look at the rates. Uh, the council's about to that. So then at uh, this time, I'll call the Excuse me, call the question. That council rise and report fees and charges at end of file number 1461-2019 to the regular council meeting for first, second, and third readings. Um, Move. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Next report, please. 
Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, uh, this goes with permissive tax exemptions, and these come up periodically. Um, and I'll pass that again off to the Director of Finance, Mr. Jeff Ford. Um, thank you. The, the first thing I should, uh, which I just noticed, is that the purpose of this report and bylaw is not to incorporate changes in the schedule of the fees and charges bylaw. It's the permissive uh, tax exemption bylaw. So. Uh, on my report, I, uh, I aired in the, my copy and paste. Uh, so the, the purpose of, of this bylaw is, uh, the bylaw uh, previous bylaw number was for the years uh, 2014 to 2019 uh, bylaw. Um, it expired uh, in 2019, so the uh, policy states that uh, those applicants have to reapply uh, for the 2020 year, and that would be a five-year bylaw again. Um, so the ones that are on this uh, bylaw have uh, are all the same, and there's one new addition. And that was the uh, Open area transition house at uh, 650 Old Old Person Way. Uh, that was for a 20 bed emergency sh shelter. And it's just the one property out of the three that we've applied for for the exemption. Um, and all the other remaining applicants on the bylaw, as I said, were on the, on the previous bylaw. So, uh, Everything that's listed in the bylaw, the, the, the amount of the exemptions uh, are all consistent with the prior bylaw. So I, I've, I've not incorporated any changes myself. It's the council decision whether they want to go with 100 percent or uh, the charter uh, doesn't specify that you have to do 100. It's you can go less. Uh, but as I said, the prior this bylaw mirrors the, the previous bylaw with the percentage of exemptions. And in most cases, uh, there's one uh, there's a, a few of the properties, and again, this is this is consistent with the prior bylaw. But there's no exemptions granted for class one or six on certain properties. It's all class eight, which is recreation and nonprofit. Um, so those are all laid out in the bylaws. So there's there's nothing. Uh, Different in this bylaw, other than that one I had mentioned, that it's a new addition, which was the open area transition house for the shelter. Uh, and again, it's for a five year period. Okay. Thank you for your report. Uh, questions uh, to staff at this time? That's what I want. Just one. Uh, outside of the new addition, I was going through them all, they all seem familiar to me. Um, Number C or letter C there, the Mount Hope Temple Society. We had them 100% exempt for Class A assessment portion only, and I think that was because at the time, the last bylaw, they were um, renting a portion of their property to Rona, but that's no longer the case. So I'd like to recommend that we change that back to 100% exempt on all property classes because they are using it that space for their own use again. It's no longer a, um, a revenue source or a donation or however that worked out to, the, to a business. So um, I think we can change that. And if things change in the future, we can adapt. But I just think uh, they don't need to be paying taxes on any of that property. If we're going to exempt it, we should exempt the entire amount. So 100% of all property tax classes. I mean, your worship. Uh, the information I have on, on my spreadsheet here is that they've they've just got class eight uh, property and it's all it's all being exempt. If it, I mean, if, the, uh, <laughs> if everything is exempt, that's fine. Uh, I, I'll, I'll double check on it. But I do remember a change <coughs> because a portion of the property was no longer being used for their pro for their services. It was being used for business and storage. Yeah. It does say 100%, but then it does say assessment portion only. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm just going to check right now.
know I should do it. So. Staff is checking that. Is there you have another question? Uh, that was another question. Thank you. Councilor uh, Erickson, you want to maybe repeat that? Only class eight, so it's, it's all no, it's all there. Perfect. Thank you, Councilor Erickson. So I just have a question on on D, Hope Gulfland Country Club. Hope Gulfland Country Club is a charitable organization, but it leases the property to a commercial venture, all of it to a commercial venture. So I'm wondering why they have. Um, recreation or assessment portion only when it's all one person leases the whole thing, one company. I'm sorry, so which property was this? D. Because it's a commercial venture now, it's not non profit anymore. Uh, for that one, the class six is exempt. Or, sorry, it's not okay. exempt. What's class six? It's business. business. That's, that's not in there. It's just strictly class eight. Sure. That's exempt. The recreation non profit of that property. So, but they're making money off the rest of it. But that's not exempt. So they're paying tax on that portion? They're paying tax on the class six. On the buildings and the yeah. shop. But what about the rest of it? Well, all I can go by is whatever class eight is. Um, and that's been class eight. Of, class eight is the recreational nonprofit portion of their property is, is what's been applied for. It. So that's it's being exempt. So, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, in particular, where the, where the restaurant and the golf pro shop yeah. is, those are class six, so those areas are taxable, and that's where they're paying taxes. But they're making money on the whole property. If the rest of the property wasn't be, wasn't there, they wouldn't be making money on it. So their business assumes the whole property, just like my my property. I have a farm, but my whole property is taxed by that. I, I'm just wondering what my understanding is, Mr. Mayor, that uh, because it's operated. Overall, by a nonprofit, it's providing a community good, which is a golf course operation. Uh, that was the logic prior councils had used in exempting them for the class eight, <coughs> but not exempting them for the class six, which is the business generation for, uh, portion used, uh, sort of operated by a contractor. So, can I ask you a question then? Is it any difference if you make money at the restaurant or you make money on the golf course? What's the difference? I'm just, I'm trying to figure it's it out. It's my because understanding that, that uh, the difference, as council understood it, is that because it's operated by a contractor and not volunteers, and, it's, and it is on operated for profit perspective, mm -hmm. that's why that class six remain taxable. Unlike the class eight, operated by the Golf and Country Club, which is largely operated as a non-profit through volunteer. I, I can see if it was operated by the non-profit. I can see no problem there, but once it's a commercial venture, then I see a problem. Okay, that's one. Okay, number, the other one is, I'm just asking a question on this one, is M, is the Open Area Transition Society. Um, can you find out, or can someone find out, if in their 
and in their budget they sent to the provincial government if the taxation is included in that. Because I don't want to see them double dipping. In, the, in their budget that they present to the provincial government, do they put in the taxation as a cost? And if they do, then I don't think they do. The, the, well, they, they would put some taxation in their budget because all, all that, keep in mind that this bylaw is strictly for the municipal portion. Mm -hmm. They're still going to get tax for property tax for the regional district. Oh, I understand that. Yeah, so. I understand that, but I'm talking about our portion. The, it's worth understanding, Mr. Mayor, that the exemption is applied for on behalf of the BC Housing Corporation, mm -hmm. uh, and they would they would get the exemption as opposed to the operator, if that's how you're thinking. Okay. That's not the way. No. Bert, no, you're the M is right. uh, the office. Oh, the office. Yes, that's <laughs> right. That's the that. yeah. I'm just I'm just asking a question. I think we should check that because I don't want to see them get say three thousand dollars tax exemption that we would be getting and they also get three thousand dollars from the provincial government to cover our taxation so they don't yeah. actually double it. I just don't want to see that if that's what's happening. Not that I pose it at all, I just I don't want to see that happen. Okay, that's that's fair. That's fair. Anyone else at this end? I'm okay. You're okay. I'm okay. I just wanted to talk about the golf course, just my recollection from the last discussions. Uh, things have changed in that time where it was wholly run by the society and the whole operation was a percent and the conversation came up about a, a corporation in there running for profit and that's when the change was to only exempt the recreational part of it. So I still think that this is, is the same case today, it's a different contractor in there operating as it was in the past, but I think the operation is still remaining the same. And um, We know that the golf course struggles as it is, and if we were to charge full taxes on that, we would need to see the uh, operator pull out and cover the full, so that's why I would still support this one. Just wanted to offer that. So I just want to comment back on that. I'm, I'm not opposed to that, I'm just thinking of principle. Mm -hmm. You know, if we do one, then a person can come and say, well, I'm doing this and I'm not doing very good, so I'd like a tax exemption. I'm talking about the principle of mm -hmm. I want the golf course to stay. I want it to be profitable. But I'm just wondering if what we're doing is really right according to all the other taxpayers in our country, all the other corporations. Okay. <coughs> all right. Uh, if there are no further questions, I'll call it. Call the question that Council Rise Report District of Hope 20, 2020-24 Present Tax Exemption Bylaw Number 1462 2019 to the regular council meeting for first, second, and third readings. Um, second. All those in favor? All those carried. To the amended item there, we're over to staff again to see. Let me just to add this. Church. Uh, in the former bylaw, it was item I, and it has now been amalgamated. Uh, and as if you can see on your copy, you'll see the red changes. Uh, the roll number has changed um, from the one that was previously on item I. Uh, a legal description changed to lot A. A plan changed from uh, uh, plan three six six five to plan E P P. 80026, and then it's adding uh, or changing uh, the PID number, the property identification number, uh, and also uh, changing the address to now read 949 and 949A, 3rd Avenue. Uh, it's strictly a 
housekeeping issue, just to <coughs> be, in, be in line with the, the assessment role um, with the change on the property. So there's no no change in the in exemption or anything like that. We're just cleaning up bylaw 1356 with this amendment. All right. Uh, any questions on this? Okay. So a motion to approve the amended bylaw. It will be a rising report. Oh, report as well. rising report as well. Okay. The council rising report, District of Hope, 2015-2024, Commission Tax Exemption Bylaw Number 1356, 2014. <coughs> Of the Council Rising Report District of Hope 2015 to 2024, <coughs> Permissive Tax Exception Amendment Bylaw Number 1463, 2019, to the regular meeting for first, second, third, third reading. The next line down. Thank you, Ms. Bellingham. All those in favor? All those in favor. Thank you that. All right. Move the German. Second, in favor, opposed, carried. We'll start our regular meeting in about five minutes here.